Thank you. You may be seated. Over the past several weeks, we've been looking at the name of God in the 23rd Psalm, which is, The Lord is my shepherd. What a marvelous, wonderful name as we contemplate what that means to us as God's people. The Lord, my shepherd. If he is your shepherd, you'll never have any needs. I shall not want. He will always provide rest and peace for you. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He will always provide the nourishment and the refreshment that you need. He leadeth me beside still waters. He'll bind up the wounds that you get as you go through life. He restoreth my soul. He'll direct your walk day by day so that you do things that are pleasing in his sight. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's with you in the most fearful moments of your life, the hours that come as you approach death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He has that which protects you and that which corrects you. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He takes care of us even when we're surrounded by those who hate us and would destroy us. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And what we have looked at most recently is the last phrase there in verse 5. Thou anointest my head with oil. And today we hope to move into that final phrase of verse 5. My cup runneth over. He feeds us at a table where he keeps the enemies away. The enemy is there. The enemy knows that we are there too. The enemy sees us eating, but he can't do anything about it because the shepherd is there as well. Thou anointest my head with oil. We saw that oil is used in the healing of wounds. We saw oil is used in the Bible for anointing to positions of power and honor and recognition. We saw that anointing was used to describe Satan's exalted position before his fall. That's a warning to us that even though we may have God's blessing and God's anointing, that we might fall from that blessing by our willful rebellion against him. We saw that anointing with oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in Scripture many times that way. We saw that the one who is called the Anointed One is our Lord Jesus Christ because the term translated anointed in the Old Testament is Mashiach or Messiah, as we would say in English, which is merely the Hebrew way of saying Christos, which means Christ. That is also a word translated into English as anointed. Christ is the anointed one. And we saw many prophetic references to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as the anointed one of God. But then we saw the application to us. Oil is a symbol in scripture of being appointed to a position of divine service, a position of divine consecration, a position of divine sanctification, that is, being set apart to be exclusively used by God. And each one of us has been anointed by God for service and for consecration. Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 1.21, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have been anointed by God for a specific purpose, for a specific service. You have been consecrated and set apart for God's purposes only and not for your own. What a wonderful blessing it is to know that Christ is our Savior. We're going to be talking in a great deal more detail today about how that anointing takes place and what refreshment it provides when we look at our phrase, my cup runneth over. We'll see that in just a moment. But we find once again in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, 
But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. It's not merely an external anointing, it's an internal anointing. It abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Let me pause for just a moment and summarize that context because it gives to us a lot of the practical application of what it means for us to be anointed by the Spirit of God. John has just discussed four different things in the immediate context. Number one, he's talked about obedience to the commands of Christ. That's verses 3 through 6. The second thing he's just discussed is having a genuine, visible love for other Christians in verses 7 through 11. The third thing he talks about is having a clear conscience from sin, being involved in spiritual warfare and absolute doctrinal truth in verses 12 through 14. And then he, immediately before this, discusses our spiritual enemies in verses 15 through 19, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Yes, we see our enemies. And then he explains the key to everything. For all four of those things, the key to all of this is called the unction of the Spirit. The word unction means anointing. In verses 20 and 21, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. That unction, that anointing of the Spirit, which is given in this context to every Christian, enables us to obey the commands of Christ. It is that anointing that enables us to have a genuine, visible love one for another. It is that anointing that gives us a clear conscience from sin. It is that anointing of the Spirit of God that gives us the empowerment for spiritual warfare. It is the anointing of the Spirit that helps us to understand the Bible, which is the foundation for all doctrinal truth. It is that anointing that enables us to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to discern and to fight against the enemies of the faith, the Word of God. Very important. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Then John gives us one more statement statement about our spiritually discerning abilities concerning who our enemies are before he finishes his thought concerning the anointing of the Holy Spirit who is given to every Christian. He gives us these words, words of final discernment. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. In 2 John, verses 7 through 11, the very next epistle after 1 John here, he tells us, If anybody comes to you and brings not the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. The doctrine of Christ is who Jesus is, and what Jesus did. The doctrine of Christ deals with the person and work of Christ. There are many people today who talk about Christ, but they don't have the Christ of Scripture. They have a Christ of their own imagination. There are many cults that talk about Christ, but they have a Christ who is less than God. They have a Christ who only paid for part of your salvation, and you must pay the rest. They perhaps have a Christ who is like a mighty archangel, but he's not really God come in the flesh. Beware of those who present a Christ 
who is not the Christ of Scripture. Beware of those who present a gospel that is different than the gospel in Scripture. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. So say I now, as I said before, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Anybody who presents any other gospel than the gospel that is given to us in the word of God, the good news, that Jesus Christ, the God-man, came to earth, died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Anybody who presents any other Christ, either in his person or in his work, Paul says, let him be accursed. Oh, dear friends, they'll come knocking on your door by twos. They'll try to get you involved in a, quote, Bible study with them. And the first thing they attack is the deity of Christ. Or they'll get you involved in some kind of a discussion group whereby they want to show to you that you have to do certain things to get to heaven. They want to minimize the work that Jesus did on the cross where you have to add something to it. Or they deny he rose from the dead as the millennial dawnists do. They say his body evaporated into gases. Or they'll try to tell you that someone greater than he came along. Oh yes, he's one of the prophets, but there's a final prophet, Muhammad. Dear friends, if any brings any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. That's not my words, that's the words of the Apostle Paul. How important it is to know the gospel of Christ. And then he finishes off that passage. He says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Them that seduce you. That's what he warned you about just before he tells you about the unction, the anointing of the Spirit of God. Those are the verses that make clear our high calling. Those are the verses that tell us that every believer has been consecrated, sanctified, and set apart for service until Jesus comes again. The anointing of the Spirit of God is absolutely essential to the teaching ministry. Did you notice that in those verses that I read? The anointing teaches you of all things. The teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer Looking for the coming of Christ motivates us to holy living and fervent service. Being anointed by the Holy Spirit enables the Spirit of God to teach us what to believe and how to live as we look for Christ's return. Verses 27 and 28, let me read it again. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And what's that do for you in terms of motivation for living? He tells you in the very next verse. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear... We, have, we may not, excuse me, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now there are people who deny that Christ will return to earth. But they are certainly at that point denying what scripture promises. Here's one of the very clear statements of it that Christ is going to return. He will return bodily just as he came. You recall in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. We have our Lord Jesus Christ going up to heaven, or verse 6, it's actually where it starts. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and following. It says, as Jesus ascended up from them into heaven, they're standing there looking at him. And suddenly two men stood by them in shining apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back in the same way that he went up into heaven, in the clouds of heaven. Many, many scriptures tell us about that. It tells us what the world's going to be like just before he comes back. 
Folks, did you know? That's the way the world is getting today, even in so-called free countries like the United States. Our Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. Our theme for Bible school has been, look up in the sky. You know, there are many things that God has put in the sky that tell us about him, starting with the rainbow and the birds and all kinds of other things. But the reason we look up is because our redemption draweth nigh, as the scripture says. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and if you're not ready, you will not go with him. Instead, you will suffer the seven worst years of tribulation on the earth that it has ever seen as it goes through the judgments of God. Where do you want to be? With Christ or here? I think those who are wise would say, I'd rather be with Christ. Well, we've gotten far afield of where we were going, but we find in these verses that the teaching of the Spirit of God will be practical in its application, not merely head theology. A lot of people like to know theology. Now, folks, I know a lot of theology. I've spent my entire life studying theology. I'm what you call a professional theologian. But that's not where it's at. If your theology doesn't make a difference in your life, it is worthless. You know how many times I've told you this. When someone tells me I'm a Christian, I ask them the question, so how has it changed your life? So how has it changed your life. You see, Christianity is not theory. Christianity is a relationship with a person which changes the way in which we live, which changes the way in which we think, which changes the way in which we speak. It's a relationship with the God of the universe who made us and who loved us. It evokes in us a response of love that wants to please the one who loved us so much. Where we live a holy life as scripture says, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It changes us from the inside out. Abiding in Christ, as he speaks here in 1 John, is the practical way that we live in the world, walking by faith, walking in the spirit, not walking according to the course of the world and the flesh and the devil. Do you understand the high calling? The high calling that God has given to you as one who has been anointed by God. It's a position that bears serious responsibility because you represent Christ to the world around you. As you fulfill your appointed, consecrated, empowered, sanctified, separated, set apart service to God, people are watching. What do they see? Yes, we have been set apart in the great love of God and we have been empowered to serve him. So are you living like a sanctified one? Are you living as those who have been anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit who have been set apart for divine service? You claim to be saved, but what difference has it made in your life? You see, the difference made by the anointing of the Spirit of God is the visible proof to the watching world that you have been anointed with oil in the presence of your enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what we're dealing with. We haven't gotten away from Psalm 23. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Your enemies are watching you. What difference has it made in your life as the Spirit of God at the moment of your salvation has come upon you? How has it changed you? Anointing for service. Anointing to live a separated, set-apart life, different from everything else around you, from the world, the flesh, and the devil. No longer motivated by your lusts of the flesh, but motivated by your love for Christ. You see, folks, there is a difference. And it is a difference that will show up visibly in your life. 
You're commanded to visibly show that you're a vessel that has been cleaned for use by Christ. Paul says so, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Therefore, if a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Now, we're going to talk about the cup in just a moment. Here you have it. You're a cup. You're a vessel. You hold something. You're going to be used in some way. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet, that is, fitting, for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Young people especially, oh dear young people, I beg you, keep yourself pure. You want to be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. Your purity is the most valuable personal possession that you have in this life. Never let anyone soil your modesty, your desires, your thoughts, your body, or your future with things that will only bring you shame. It starts in the heart. Proverbs tells us that. Proverbs 4.23 Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. 1 Timothy 5.22 Paul says, Keep yourself pure. Remember this, lust can never wait to get. Lust can never wait to get. But love can always wait to give. To give to someone else who has waited for the bonds of marriage. Lust is selfish. It will use you and it will throw you away. Love is sacrificial and gives without expecting anything in return. Dear young people, learn the difference while you're young and before you begin to develop feelings that you never had before. No, I have not gotten away from Psalm 23. My cup runneth over. You see, you are a cup. You hold something. Don't let your cup get dirty. My cup runneth over. The word cup here is a very common Hebrew word used in modern Israel today, kos. It's a cup. Class. Sometimes it's translated in scripture as my lot or my portion. And you know it says my cup runneth over. God does not give us a stingy portion. It's a cup that flows up from the inside until it overflows its brim. We're in a shepherd's psalm right now. And did you know that sometimes a, a shepherd would let a lamb drink from the shepherd's own cup? We have an illustration of this idea when Nathan the prophet confronted David about his adultery with Bathsheba. You remember the incident, but you may not remember this particular phrase as Nathan is speaking to David. And David is listening because Nathan has come and said, there's a bad guy in your kingdom who has done some really bad stuff and you need to deal with it as the king because, you know, this is a problem you need to solve. And so he tells him about a man who had a little tiny lamb. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3. The poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb. There was this rich guy that had everything. He had lots of sheep. He had a visitor who came by and, uh, uh, and he was going to throw a big banquet for that visitor. And there was this poor guy who only had this one little sheep. He saved one little ewe lamb which he had brought and nourished up and it grew up together with him and with his children. It was a little house pet. It did eat of his own meat and look at this next phrase. And drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And you know the story how the rich man comes and takes that one little lamb and cuts its throat, chops it up, cooks it, and eats it with his guest. And David is furious. And David says, that man's going to pay back five, four, fourfold, and he's going to die himself. And Nathan the prophet pointed at David 
and said, Thou art the man! And David caught it immediately. He knew that Nathan, the prophet, knew about his adultery with Bathsheba, that he had taken one wife that belonged to one other man. And even though he had plenty himself, he had stolen it, and then he had had Uriah the Hittite put to death in war. You know what David's first words were? After Nathan pointed the finger and said, Thou art the man, David said, I have sinned. Dear people, when God convicts you of sin, don't argue with him. When God convicts you of sin, don't make excuses about it. When God convicts you of sin, don't try to change the subject. When God convicts you of sin, say, I have sinned. That's how you find mercy in the sight of God who is about to judge. And Nathan responded, therefore thou shalt not die. But he would pay back fourfold four of his sons taken in death. Dear people, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what the scripture tells us. We have a God who is long-suffering, a God who is merciful, a God who forgives, but a God who will not tolerate sin. It must be dealt with, and either it will be dealt with by the blood of Christ, or you will have to pay for it yourself. Those are your only options. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's Jesus speaking. Either he's lying or he's telling us the truth. Now, if you reject him, you're calling him a liar. If you trust him, you understand what a marvelous sacrifice he made for you. But you know, there's something even deeper here, deeper insight than just the lamb drinking from the shepherd's cup. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of the rivers of living water that would bubble up in the cup of and from the cup of those who receive his Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, that's what happened in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. When the disciples, the 120 altogether, were gathered together in the upper room, and there was a sound as of a great rushing wind that came upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and tongues of flames sat upon their heads, and they began to speak foreign languages that they'd never learned. Eighteen languages are listed for us there in that text. The Holy Ghost came upon them. The day of Pentecost is the arrival, in a very special way, of the Holy Ghost. Now, the charismatic gifts are no longer being given today. We've studied that in time past. But the Holy Spirit is still being given. And when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you received the permanently indwelling Spirit of God. John chapter 7, Jesus promised that. In the chronology of the Gospel of John, the feast that it's talking about here is the Feast of Tabernacles. You remember there are seven very important feasts that God gave to Israel in the Old Testament. But Tabernacles was one of the three most important feasts to which every Jewish male was required to go to Jerusalem every year. The other two required feasts, of course, were the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Pentecost. And Jesus alludes to both of those in his uh, message here in John chapter 7. The Feast of Tabernacles reminded the Jews of two things, and they foreshadow for us what's going on with the Spirit of God in our hearts and what is foreshadowed in Psalm 23 when it says, My cup runneth over. The Feast of Tabernacles first reminded the Jews, number one, of the ingathering of the harvest as the blessing of God who always provided for their needs year after year. He's the one who gave them their abundant harvests. The second thing it reminded them of was 
They're wandering in the wilderness where they lived in booths. Tabernacles are booths or tents. That word means the protection and the blessing that God gave to Israel as they journeyed through the wilderness to the promised land. You're journeying through a wilderness right now. You're on your way to a wonderful place if you trusted in Christ. And God gave Israel protection and blessing. He always met their needs when they had no place else to call home. It reminded them they'd been delivered from the house of bondage, which was Egypt and been brought into the glorious freedom that God himself gave them. If you've trusted in Christ, you've been delivered from the bondage of sin. You've been brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God, as the scripture says. God led them through the wilderness. Does that remind you of anything that's going on in Psalm 23? Just like a shepherd leads his sheep. God provided their daily food. That was the manna that they got every morning. He never gave them too much. He never gave them too little. And it's interesting, they were not permitted to hoard what God gave them. They couldn't hoard it even overnight, or else it would get worms, and it would rot, and it would stink. You remember that? There were some of the people who said, man, this is really good stuff, I like this. You know, they're gobbling it down when it shows up on the ground that first morning. And so some of them tried to put it in pots and keep it overnight. They thought, you know, we don't think it's going to show up tomorrow. We're, we're going to get some of this, put it in a pot, and then we'll have some for tomorrow, too. And the next morning it said... It had worms and it stank. But the next morning, God gave them manna. And the next morning, God gave them manna. And the next morning, God gave them manna. And the next morning, God gave them manna. But suddenly, on the sixth day, God said, Now today, I want you to put it into a pot because I'm not going to give it on the Sabbath. I'm not going to give it on Saturday. There will be no manna on the ground tomorrow. Notice, do you see the flashing billboard up there with the neon lights? No manna tomorrow. Get twice as much today. You know what? Some people thought, eh, this is a natural occurrence. It shows up every morning, so it'll be there tomorrow. And you know what? They went out the next morning, and it was not there. <laughs> but those who saved it overnight thought, man, if I save it overnight, it's going to stink in the morning. It's going to have worms in it. But on Friday night, they kept it overnight, and the next morning... It had no worms, and it did not stink. It's supernatural, folks. It's not a natural occurrence that's occurring here. But the shepherd is leading through the wilderness. The shepherd is providing for the sheep. You notice something else there that we also see. The supernatural provision, not only of the daily food for the sheep, and Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. The daily provision of the shepherd for the sheep, the daily provision of God for his children wandering through the wilderness. But God also provided them with an abundance of water from the rock. It overflowed with more than enough water for millions of people. They had water for more than 40 years in the desert. God is not stingy. God always supplies abundantly. Psalm 73, 10, Therefore his people return hither, and the waters of a full cup are wrung out unto them. Do you know who the rock was that provided for them in the desert? The Bible tells us who, not just what. The Bible tells us who the rock was. It was Christ himself. Jesus is promising in John 7, which we just looked at, that He's going to provide this water of the Spirit of God. But he was the rock in the desert. Paul says so, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, that's the cloud of the Shekinah that led them through the wilderness, all passed through the sea, that's crossing the Red Sea, all did eat of the same spiritual meat, that's the manna that we just talked about. Verse 4. And all did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Do you remember when the people complained they had no water? God said, strike the rock. Moses struck the rock. And the water flowed out, and they had plenty. On a second occasion, the people were complaining about water. And God said, speak to the rock. And Moses said, what ye rebels, must we bring you forth water out of this rock? And he struck the rock again, and it brought forth water. But God said, Moses, you didn't sanctify me in the eyes of the people. Because you hit that rock, you're not going to get to go into the promised land. 
you say, whoa, man, that's mean. Why did God do that? Because the rock was Christ. And how many times did Christ have to be smitten for our sins? Once. Read the book of Hebrews. Christ is not offered over and over and over and over again. We don't sacrifice Christ when we have the Lord's table. Christ is offered once for sin forever. Hebrews tells us that in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, and Hebrews 11. Once, once, and Moses broke the picture. Jesus only had to be smitten for our sins once. Paul tells us the rock that followed them. Have you ever seen a moving rock? Have you ever seen a moving rock that produced millions of gallons of water? You know, the scripture talks about a supernatural God. We're not dealing with natural occurrences in the text. We're talking about the God who made heaven and earth. Those of you who are coming to the adult class have been seeing the incredible creatures that God has made and how it could not possibly have been evolved. I mean, incredible intricate details and beauty and complexity and interaction and benefit for men. Ah, oh, friends, that's what Jesus is talking about in John 7, 37 through 39, when he promises the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a refreshing, abundant, overflowing water for millions of thirsty souls. He never runs dry. When we come to Jesus, he gives us the Holy Spirit who will quench every thirst that we can ever possibly have. In the last day, this is verse 37, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Did you know, before Jesus offered that to the Jews in the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7, Jesus had offered the same living water to an adulterous, half-breed woman despised by the Jews, despised by her own people, the woman of Samaria, who'd been through five men and the man she was then living with wasn't her own husband. Jesus offered her that same living water. The Bible tells us Christ came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come to save righteous people. He came to save sinners. That includes us all. John 4, he must needs go through Samaria, and he cometh to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there, a source of water. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Our fathers, are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But listen to verse 14. It's exactly the same thing he says in chapter 7. Three chapters later when he's in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. Listen to what he says. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Rivers of water flowing out of your belly. Rivers of living water that always are there that quench your thirst. He didn't just offer it to self-righteous Jews in Jerusalem in the temple. He offered it to an adulterous woman, half-breed, 
in Samaria. He offers it to you. You know, a well that springs up is an artesian spring. The spring refills the well over and over even when there's not been any rain in the area. It's water that comes through the ground from a high source in the mountains. It's not merely groundwater. You know, the world offers you a drink of water, but it's a deceptive water. Jeremiah tells us about it, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. In chapter 17, 15 chapters later, he says the same thing. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. They shall depart from me, shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Turning your back on God, that's what it's like. You know, in claiming to be the fountain of living waters, Jesus was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be Jehovah. He is the one who is called the fountain of cleansing. Zechariah 13, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And he said unto me, this is Jesus in Revelation, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Come to Jesus. That's the only place that there is a living fountain. That's the only place that there is an artesian fountain springing up into everlasting life. That's the way it is with us when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside us. The psalmist says, my cup runneth over. That is the fountain, the cup of salvation. When we come to Christ, when we call on him, the one who is the Lord, his cup is infinitely large in its provision. Psalm 116, 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Well, our time has passed. There's so much more to say about the cup in Psalm 23 and the way God uses that same word throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament to tell us of Christ, the one to whom we can come, and he will quench our thirst with the Spirit of God. Every thirst that you can ever have, he will meet that need. He will give you the refreshment. My cup runneth over. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. There is so much more here. We've only scratched the surface today. I pray for every person in this place that they would take the cup of salvation, the cup that runs over, the cup that is not stagnant pool with scum on it, not groundwater that's soaking back into the ground and evaporating, but the water at which the sheep can drink, the still water. He leads them by still waters. It's not running water that'll carry them away, but it's a water that rejuvenates. It's a water that always has something bubbling up from underneath so that the water is there fresh and cool, refreshing for those who are the sheep of the Good Shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, once again for your word. We pray that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to our closing hymn today, number 617.